Welcome to Primary Care Today on ReachMD. I'm your host, Dr. Brian McDonough. And with me today is Dr. Edmund Privetkin. Dr. Privetkin is with Thomas Jefferson University Medical College. He's also with the Monell Science Center. And we're going to talk a little bit about sensation, what we smell, what we hear, what we feel, what we taste. But in his case particularly, it's about taste and the sense of smell. That's his area of interest. Dr. Privetkin is a otolaryngologist. By trade, he trained at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School and then went on and did his internship and residency in otolaryngology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and did a fellowship in facial plastic surgery at Stanford University Medical Center in Stanford, California. So, first of all, welcome to our program. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's my pleasure to be here, Brian. You know, when we talk about these things, and we've had a couple of programs on primary care today where we've talked a little bit about the sense of smell. We've talked about what a complex area it is, yet we take it so much for granted. I know as an otolaryngologist, and for family docs and primary care docs listening, there are different obstructive things that can lead to problems with the sense of smell. And I wanted to start off, if I could, and just ask you about polyps, because I'm sure in your experience that might be something you deal with quite a bit. Yes, that's absolutely true. You know, polyps are the primary obstructive cause for a loss of sense of smell. The odor molecules just can't get up to the area where a sense of smell is, and, and therefore the brain never senses the odors. Um, the, the polyps can be of many different forms, but typically polyps are caused by an inflammatory reaction, often associated with asthma or with aspirin sensitivity. People develop these polyps in the nose, and they can grow to the point where they basically block the odors from getting there. Actually, I've seen polyps grow so large that they are coming out of the nose. They're actually expanding the nose, and uh, those, of course, are extreme cases. Most patients come to see us before those things happen. So when someone has polyps, and let's say they're at the point where you want to do surgery, what is the approach? I mean, how complicated is it? Is it something that leads lingering effects for people? Do they all of a sudden smell things they haven't smelled for years, if not their entire life? Well, you know, polyps are not things that are congenital, so it's not something that affects you from your entire life. Polyps usually arise uh, in most people sometime in their teens or 20s. Um, they develop because of an inflammatory reaction. Some people feel they develop because of funguses that grow in the nose. Other people feel that they're due to allergies. And they are just basically watery bags of mucus that uh, develop in the area of the sinuses. When we treat the polyps, the first treatment is really to treat them with medication. So we'll give them oral prednisone, uh, an oral steroid, to shrink the polyps, and then we'll often give an intranasal steroid to put in the, to squirt in the nose to try to keep the polyps under control. Unfortunately, many times that isn't effective. We can rinse the nose with a steroid solution. We can give medications such as Montelukast, which is a leukotriene inhibitor. Those things can help, but sometimes nothing really does the trick, and patients do need surgery. In those kinds of situations, what you described is exactly what happens. When you remove the polyps, you remove the obstruction, and many people have this absolutely amazing new ability or reborn ability to smell and and especially to appreciate flavors. Unfortunately, it's not always long-lasting. If we don't find the cause and we don't get things under control, the polyps can grow back and people can have further problems. And when they grow back, in your experience, how long does it take for that? Is it something that would happen in a year, five years, a month? Oh, my goodness. You know, I've had patients that have literally had surgery done, and within two to three months, the polyps have returned. Most of those cases are really extreme. They're usually associated with patients that have a complex of not only polyps, but aspirin sensitivity and asthma. They usually have severe allergies, and they're a struggle to control. For our patients, we generally do what's called endoscopic sinus surgery, where we use endoscopes to remove the polyps, and we do as clean a procedure as possible, removing as much of the polyp tissue but leaving as much of the normal tissue as possible. After the surgery, then what we do is we place people on intranasal steroids and other types of medications to decrease inflammation so that they don't come back. And, of course, we have success stories where people have polyps removed and they never come back. Um, it varies so much from patient to patient. It's actually one of the really hot areas of research within 
the field of rhinology within the field of sinus difficulties. And one last question to conclude on the polyp topic is when they take those steroid medications, are these people on the medications for life or they, they take them periodically? How long can you take them? Well, you know, that's a wonderful question because truthfully, oral steroids uh, have very big side effects. You can end up with changes in the way that your body looks. You can have changes in the way that your face looks. You can have weakening of your bones and weakening of your muscles. You can have ulcers that develop. So long-term oral steroid therapy is usually not an option for most people. Um, That's why most of us try to prescribe mostly intranasal steroid sprays or even irrigations with steroids to try to limit the amount of steroid that's actually taken into the body. And that's why alternate therapies such as Montelukast, uh, a leukotriene inhibitor that goes by the trade name of Singular, that's another option for people to try to decrease the inflammation. Um, most of my patients will, who are on long-term therapy basically use intranasal steroids and Montelukast every day. And then when it gets to the point where the polyps are growing back a bit, the loss of the smell is occurring, then we give them a course of steroids maybe once or twice a year. I really don't like to use the oral steroids more than twice a year because I think you start to increase the risk of the complications we discussed. And is the feeling that with the intranasal steroid, it isn't absorbed to such a large extent that it causes problems or issues? Exactly. You know, for the most part, the intranasal steroids stay within the nose and have a local effect. Um, In fact, there are some that are even safe to use in pregnancy, have been rated uh, safe for pregnancy. So systemic absorption tends not to be a problem. If you're just tuning in, you are listening to Primary Care Today on ReachMD. I'm Dr. Brian McDonough, your host. I am speaking with Dr. Edmund Privetin, and we are talking about different issues associated with sensation. We talked about the sensation of smell and polyps. What about the sensation of taste? I, I mean, I certainly know in my patients who are in the golden years, you know, the, the octogenarians and others, they, they really have difficulty with taste, and they maybe load their food with salt and sodium. And I go back and forth and say, well, that isn't good for you. But then I say, well, if you're 87, you know, who am I to tell you? And we go back and <laughs> forth. Uh, what about those issues? What happens to the sensation of taste as we get older? And what are those changes? Well, there are a number of things that happen. Uh, one of them is that we start to lose the Um, saliva that we produce earlier in life that sort of helps to dissolve the food that we eat, helps to moisten the taste buds, and actually present the the taste sense to the taste buds. So a lot of reasons why people don't have a good sense of taste as they get older is that they've actually lost a lot of the lubrication. And if you have a really, really dry mouth or have experienced a really dry mouth, you can sort of appreciate that, well, I can't really taste things as easily. And a lot of folks have that problem. Apart from those natural processes that occur with aging, such as the drying of the mouth, there is also a loss of the sense of smell as we get older. And smell maps become muddied. And because of that, flavors become a little bit muddy, too. You know, your sense of flavor, really, not just salt, sour, sweet, and bitter, but your sense of flavor is determined by your sense of smell. One really neat experiment to do that we like to do at Monell is you can take a bunch of jelly beans that are different flavors, and you can basically pinch your nose so you can't smell them and try to taste them. You won't be able to tell the different flavors of the jelly beans, but as soon as you can, you can, you can smell them, then you'll be able to distinguish all the different flavors. Well, as we age, our sense of smell changes. What we used to think was that it became less sensitive. And it is true that the number of smell receptors go down as folks age. But what also seems to happen is that the receptors appear to be less specific. So in other words, these little receptors will fire neurons when they're not supposed to. And the pattern that is usually associated with, say, a nice flavorful steak, that pattern goes off also when you taste peanut butter. And so you start to be, have more difficulty discriminating between tastes. And of course, that makes it you know, less likely that you're going to appreciate flavors the way you did before. And you start salting and sweetening your foods because those are the, the tastes that really you can appreciate instead of the fine flavors that you did in younger years. I know in reading your personal statement, you talk about your interests that we're discussing, but also you're interested in the pathological processes associated with chemosensory dysfunction 
and you brought in your research to include exploration of olfactory and gustatory relationships with other organ systems. And that, that kind of raised my interest. Like, what is the relationship with other organ systems in the body? What have you learned? Well, you know, this is fascinating research. It's really only come to light in the, in the last decade, uh, really the last five years. We have tremendous researchers such as Dr. Paul Horn at Monell and other places that have discovered that there are flavor receptors, there are taste receptors essentially in your stomach and uh, in your intestinal tract. And we don't know why they're there. We don't know exactly how they function, but clearly they're very similar to the receptors in the in the taste buds. And so, you know, we're trying to figure that out. We're trying to figure out, you know, is there a process by which we're sort of tasting foods with different organs in the GI tract rather than just in the um, the mouth itself. Another example of this is there appear to be sort of bitter receptors in your windpipe or in the area around your windpipe. And that sort of makes sense because if, uh, if food or something goes down the wrong way, that's another stimulus to cough it out, so to speak. So these are fascinating new discoveries which we're just starting to figure out. We really are just um, just starting to explore uh, whether where these uh, taste receptors are and exactly what their function is. And, and that's uh, sort of the next exciting decade of research probably in this because, of course, people are asking, well, if I have taste receptors in my gut, is that why I'm fat? <laughs> you know, is that what? And, uh, and, you know, there, there appear to be changes in these taste receptors and things in patients that are diabetic and in patients that do have weight disorders and things. And these are the things that research is trying to, to really elucidate. Are there certain areas that you wanted to bring up, topics that you thought would be interesting for our physician audience? Well, I think one of the most exciting things that is going on in the, in the realm of smell today is the uh, new research that we're going to be doing at Monell, which involves looking at olfactory stem cells. And what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be taking stem cells from the nose and trying to culture olfactory neurons. That sounds complicated, but basically what we're trying to do is figure out ways to regrow those receptors in the nose that are sometimes lost when people lose their sense of smell. There are about 2 million people in the United States who have a loss of sense of smell. These are folks that can't smell gas leaks in their home, they can't really appreciate spoiled food and are at risk, and also they get depressed because they can't smell. And what we're hoping to do over the course of the next decade of research at Monell is to figure out a way to regrow these receptors. This type of regenerative medicine really is the going to be the future for so many different treatments, I think, in the human body. And um, smell, I think, is a place where we can really make an impact in terms of regenerating a sense organ. Uh, and that's very exciting stuff. You know, when you look at that and you just think of the role of stem cells throughout the body and what they're doing, and it, it does seem almost, I mean, really like it's limitless in so many respects. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm a gardener, so it's sort of funny. You know, when I plant a tomato seed, uh, I expect to get a tomato. When I plant a basil seed, I expect to get a, a basil plant. But, you know, with stem cells, that's not the case. It seems like uh, we can plant the same seed and treat it a little differently, you know, water it a little differently, fertilize it a little differently, and then determine what kind of plant we grow. That's really amazing. Uh, like you said, the, the potential is really limitless. And I think that when we look at human regenerative systems, one of the things that we really are committed, I think, in this next decade of, in medicine in general is to really look at these diseases that involve neurodegenerative type of pathways, Alzheimer's, stroke victims, all these things could potentially be reversed if we have a way of regenerating these neurons. And the nose is sort of a little laboratory which we can work in because we've got essentially parts of the brain that extend into the nose that, that modulate the sense of smell. So if we can manipulate them successfully, then hopefully we can take what we learn and apply it to different areas of the brain and different organ systems to, to help other patients. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time, Dr. Privikin, and we really enjoyed having you on the program. Absolutely a pleasure. It's a delight to talk with you, Brian. This is Dr. Brian McDonough. If you missed any of this discussion, please visit reachmd.com slash primarycaretoday 
to download the podcast and learn more on the series. Thanks again for listening.